and I'm going to refer to him as Paul, and I'm going to talk to you about Paul in a very stripped down way. Um, it is based on real person, but I've extracted from his account uh, anything that could be remotely, hopefully remotely identifiable, uh, because I just want to present to you the essence of the case, really, just so that you can see uh, the workings of the HCR 20 version 3, uh, which I think has added markedly to my thinking about the case over and above the HCR version 2 for some reasons that I hope will become clear, not least because it significantly promotes the use of formulation about which I'm becoming increasingly uh, preoccupied. So, Paul is a, is a, a real person, um, or based, uh, this account will be based on the real person I'm calling Paul. The referral came from uh, mental health services in the community, um, secondary mental health services, and what they wanted was a risk assessment, risk formulation, risk management plan to help them to try to work with Paul because they were concerned that if they tried to engage him in any sort of interventions, that they would, that the health care providers would themselves be at risk because previous experience of him had been that when they tried to treat him, he had uh, reported violent thoughts and violent intentions towards them as healthcare providers. So they were specifically looking at risk to them. So what they wanted in the risk management plan was particular focus on treatment issues, how to deliver treatment safely. So um, that's where the referral came from. Um, I spoke with, uh, on several occasions, I spoke with Paul himself also with professionals who were involved with him. Paul had had a few inpatient stays, uh, as well as uh, receiving care from a community mental health team. So I spoke with members of staff in the inpatient facility he had occasionally been in, and um, his care coordinator in the community. He was in supported accommodation. I spoke to some of the people who worked with him in supported accommodation. And I read uh, uh, everything I could get my hands on about him, including his, um, uh, his criminal record, uh, his criminal history uh, printout from the police, which gave a lot of very interesting detail that wasn't otherwise in the clinical records. And when I met with Paul uh, on the first occasion, uh, he was uh, an inpatient in a psychiatric, hospital, a psychiatric ward. At the time, he presented, uh, he, uh, a gentleman in his early 40s, um, he presented very nervous, very anxious, very frightened of the assessment, frightened of what it was going to do uh, for him or to him, what the outcome would be. He, uh, over the course of the meetings, he was uh, tended to, to blame other people for some of the things that had happened to him or some of the things that he had done. He minimised his responsibility in respect of these um, uh, activities. And he, he appeared fragile um, and in, just in his manner when he was challenged, he would uh, react uh, angrily, at one point, he said to me, I'm having thoughts of uh, attacking you, I'm seeing you with your throat cut, just in the course of the assessment itself. And um, it was fairly clear from having read a lot before I went to see him and spoken to several of the people that I, I saw in total, that um, his self-report was a problem. He was, uh, what he told me um, varied uh, on, uh, what he told me on one occasion varied from what he might tell me about the same thing on another occasion and what he told me varied in part from what I was able to read from other sources that he had told other people at other times or, or had been recorded as facts uh, about him uh, on other occasions. So it was a sort of muddled picture. Um, he's, a, he's, uh, just to say, he's, he's a fairly common sort of um, referral that we might receive, a person in the community who's causing concern, um, who having difficulty fitting into mental health services. I, I will say that this is a gentleman without a major mental illness. He doesn't have a major mental illness. He has, in fact, his primary diagnosis is personality disorder. And he has a co-occurring substance misuse of alcohol. He's, had, he's been dependent on a variety of substances across the year. The current concern is with alcohol. And, and most of our mental health services, the vast majority of our mental health services, and it may be the case with you as well, are geared up towards the treatment of people with acute psychotic disorders. And it's difficult to, to find places and services that will work with people whose primary diagnosis is personality disorder. And that's often when they will come to uh, our service for some extra support, not just in manage, understanding and managing risk, but also helping them to gain access to services, sometimes by the back door. Um, services that otherwise wouldn't take this person on with a primary diagnosis of personality dis disorder. So Paul, so I, my, my first question was, uh, what's he at risk of? Well, of course, um, uh, the, the, the big concern was risk of violence, and that'll become clear 
why he um, has a history of being violent towards uh, strangers, or threatening violence, actually violent and threatening violence, towards strangers in the street, also his peers, people that he associates with, either in his uh, um, housing situation or people he chooses to um, associate with, and also um, threats of violence uh, towards healthcare professionals, which generally is a precursor to his uh, not attending for treatment which is then in itself a precursor to a kind of wide-scale destabilisation, disengagement, alcohol use and crisis, uh, a, a fairly typical um, um, antecedent to an inpatient, emergency inpatient stay. So we, we, he has got um, this in his past, though, uh, the, the mental health professional who referred him to our service, and I picked up the referral, um, said, uh, like, help us to understand his risk and, and to help us in particular to understand if we try to take him on, what the risks are to us. So I, I used the uh, HCR version 3. I have used uh, version 2 on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of occasions. Um, so uh, I was, uh, was with pleasure to go through the manual, the early version of the manual, the, the one that, was, uh, that I had the pleasure of receiving last year, as opposed to the one that you will receive later on, which is this one which is very, very, very attractive, and uh, I will treasure. <laughs> it's funny, the value of these things. <laughs> Henrik, your, your pink manual has uh, battered and bruised mine too. <laughs> um, anyway, I, so it was with pleasure to pour over uh, a manual, scrutinising every word, um, a new, about concepts, old familiars, old friends, like uh, personality disorder and major mental illness, and, and, and gain new... New th I just love the, the way that you specified the items so much more closely. And, and in particular, one of my favourite items, because it's so critical, is insight. And I, I love what you've, how you've, you've really detailed that item. And I love how you've gone from impulsivity to instability in the clinical items as well. Anyway, I'll come on to some more of that shortly. I, I went through with Paul, the version 3, and I used a worksheet. Um, which I, oh, it is, yeah. I use the worksheet, uh, the, the extended worksheet, because I, I'm, I'm obsessive compulsive and I like to have lots of room to put lots of details in, in case I forget anything that's terribly important. So I went through it on meticulous detail, on a little scratchy pen, and very small writing, fit more in. And, and with Paul, fairly, um, fairly as I expected when I had a first... <coughs> Uh, overview of him and his records and first couple of conversations with people, uh, I suspected that quite a number of the risk factors would be present with him. Um, and not only present, but relevant. So what, just in, in summary, um, all the historical risk factors were all uh, present and relevant, apart from two. Uh, employment has never figured in any of the harm that he's um, uh, in, enacted against other people. He only had about two or three years of employment in his very early 20s. He hadn't been employed since, so it doesn't... And his, most of his violence has been concentrated in the last few years. And he doesn't have a major mental disorder. Uh, in respect of the clinical items, all the items were present and relevant except symptoms of major mental disorder. And all the risk management items were relevant except for professional services. Professional services were, in fact, um, quite geared up, very geared up towards supporting this gentleman because um, he had... Um, <coughs> He has uh, uh, the alcohol misuse problem, which allowed him to access services um, reasonably freely. Um, so profession the professionals were behind him and did want to support him. There was a problem with his engagement with them, however, which was a later item. So that's just it in summary, that um, the vast majority of the items were relevant. But that's not enough just to say that they're relevant. We have to go through the process of explaining why they're relevant. Now, I always say to people when I do training in risk assessment is that you want to start a risk assessment not knowing the outcome. You want to learn by the process of doing a risk assessment. If you already know the answer before you, you know, you know what you're going to do and it's all very straightforward before you do a risk assessment, then you ask yourself why you're doing it and you may be doing it because you're going to a tribunal or you're going to a parole board hearing or whatever and you have to be absolutely transparent in your decision making. But ideally you engage in this process because you want to and you will learn from the process of doing so voyage of discovery that you take um, yourself as a practitioner, you take with your colleagues who have referred the case to you, and ideally you'll take with the service user, the client, him or herself. So just if you let me go through them in, in a little bit more detail, 
um, the items that were, re- uh, were present. I want to say to you something about why they're relevant, because this process of going from presence to relevance is highly important for when we get to the part about formulation. You need to be thinking on on the review of each of the items um, why this item is relevant and in what way it would be relevant to the harm that this person might uh, carry out. So Paul has convictions as an adult. His earliest conviction for violence is in his early 20s uh, for actual and threatened uh, harm. So he's got uh, convictions for threatening as well as convictions for wounding and assault. He's got multiple victim types, so he's got um, uh, he's offended against men and women. Um, he has offended against people um, who are, have uh, uh, just encountered him or argued with him, and some of his offences have been racially motivated as well. Um, the relevance of his history of violence is that it's frequent and uh, pervasive, so we see him using uh, violence habitually, frequently, instead of using other more adaptive ways of coping with typical sorts of situations, which I'll come on to later, generally involving criticism or challenge, and a severe level of violence, uh, violence um, uh, on occasions. So it's relevant because it's a, it's a habit, it's a regularly used response by him. And where it's regular, it's habitual, uh, we're dealing with something that's going to be, take some time to try to uh, change the conditions of its reinforcement over that lengthy period of time. Other antisocial behaviour, while he's got a, an abundance of convictions for other sorts of offences, um, from adolescence, from, from when he was about, uh, well, there were reports from when he was in his early teens, and his first convictions when he was 18. Mainly for acquisitive offences, his early career seems to be mainly acquisitive, uh, theft, burglary, that sort of thing. Um, in the sort of uh, mid, early to mid-twenties, there were more driving offences, some drug offences. He was self-reported and it's acknowledged that he was involved in local gangs and, which were responsible for distributing and collecting drugs and money. Um, and he has also got convictions for offences against the courts, failure to surrender and committing offences while on bail or conditional discharge. So he's a, he's a gentleman who's got lots of antisocial characteristics in the middle of which um, we see this uh, pattern of violence, which actually over the last few years, he's got six convictions for violent offences, five of which have happened in the last six years. So there's been a concentration of them laterally, so we're seeing something of an escalating pattern. Anyway, the relevance of his antisocial behaviour is he's got these pervasive antisocial attitudes and beliefs, which mean that he, he is, uh, will turn his hand towards breaking the rules without much regard for the consequences for himself or others of doing so. In respect of his relationships, there's a pattern both in his intimate and his non-intimate relationships, which the, 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 the scrutiny of both... Um, which you do with the risk of sexual violence protocol, the RSVP is excellent, so I really like the the broadening of this item too. Um, Almost all the relationships he's got, family, intimate, um, uh, non-intimate, are all conflicted or end up in conflict, generally within quite uh, a short space of time. Um, uh, He has also been violent within relationships, DV there, standing for domestic violence. In his intimate relationships, he has been a violent uh, man. And the conflict that any of these, sorry, the, 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 the effect of any of the conflict uh, that he has is to destabilise him. He becomes uh, panicky, more anxious, uh, he copes less well, and generally when he copes less well, he, he disengages from care, uh, he stops taking his medication, and he starts drinking. And then his decision-making becomes appalling, really, really makes bad decisions, he defaults, and, uh, and he, he becomes difficult to work with. Substance misuse, uh, ca- alcohol is his primary concern, but he does have a history of uh, cannabis and cocaine use in the past. The relevance of that to his violence risk is that it destabilizes him. When he's destabilized, um, that's when he's more likely to be violent. Um, almost all of his violence, apart from some of his drug distribution related violence, has happened when he has been destabilized mentally. Uh, alcohol also disinhibits him. He gets himself into situations that he can't cope with or that uh, he doesn't know how to manage. Um, and as I say, violence and the procurement of uh, drugs uh, and their dealing in the past. 
Now, in respect to personality disorder, um, he has got a, 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 a very strong presentation of borderline or emotionally unstable personality disorder, but there's very significant traits of antisocial, paranoid, and narcissistic uh, features as well. When he is examined through the, the PCLR, which is excellently, and I, I, I support it, the dropping of the necessity for doing a PCLR, I'm really pleased with that outcome. Um, uh, but when one does look at uh, the psychopathy checklist for this gentleman, his rating, his overall rating is uh, particularly high uh, as to put him uh, on or above the, th um, the, 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 the threshold at which we would say that uh, psychopathy was present in uh, UK samples. So he's got a pronounced level of uh, personality traits characterised by dominance, coercion, hostility, which rather flew in the face of his, uh, his presentation to me in an interview, but that became more clear once uh, some of these examinations have been done in more detail. And the relevance of personality disorder to his future violence risk is it creates or it's, it explains the instability that, uh, he, that's visible, that it um, helps us to understand the persistence of hostile attributions. He expects that other people are going to do him harm, therefore he's ready to have a fight, he's ready to try to defend himself against what he perceives of as attack. His mood is labile, and his motivation is largely self-centred. He wants to know what's going to happen to better things for him and largely what you're going to do about it. In terms of his traumatic experiences, well, this was, uh, this was a very revealing part of the, uh, uh, um, the assessment. Uh, he had uh, some diabolical parenting, terrible parenting. Um, his, uh, he witnessed uh, very high levels of domestic violence between his parents, largely his stepfather and his mother. Uh, he was victimised himself, um, and he, in his, uh, he was a bully at school. And when he was working in, uh, when he was uh, engaged with gangs, he saw a lot of violence uh, and uh, it perpetrated a great, great deal of it as well. He himself was attacked with a machete, which is a favoured instrument in some parts of uh, Manchester. Uh, that and with increasing regularity, grenades. Um, so what we decided as the, the, the relevance of the traumatic, experience was, tra traumatic experiences was that it endowed him uh, with a limited repertoire of skills and capabilities to cope with the stresses and strains of, never mind adult life, but even adolescent life. So he doesn't have good memories of managing things well. It's also uh, led him to take a role, a slightly more passive role, in his um, thinking about his difficulties, uh, such that he will say, well, you know, I, I, it's because of my early experiences that I'm like this. In respect to violent attitudes, we can see some of their presence through his membership of gangs. He's more recently, or for a long period of time, been carrying weapons. And he will say, uh, on uh, early and open questioning, that uh, it's, there are some situations in which violence, there's, there's no other option but violence. So it's quite easy to elicit pro-violence attitudes. And that's what they are. They, they give him permission to be violent under a range, uh, a quite considerable range of circumstances. In respect of his treatment of supervision response, another excellent, excellently defined item that you'll see in both the H, the C, and the R um, uh, subscales. Uh, what we've seen so far is, is, is kind of uh, keeping the lid on his uh, difficulties um, and the way in which he engages with other people, just about keeping the lid on it. No systematic resolution of his problems as yet. And um, this, whilst we're keeping the lid on it, you can see when you stand back this, this, this increasing frequency of violence, which is worrying. So we'd have to say that his response to treatment to date has been poor, um, that there have been a number of violations. He's, he ha part of his treatment plan is to take uh, anti-abuse disulpiride so that it helps him to um, uh, not drink. Uh, he finds that a useful treatment strategy, except that on each of his inpatient stays, he's uh, hoarded the, the, the uh, anti-abuse and then gone out on a bender. He's gone out drinking and come back the next morning um, with a terrible hangover. Uh, and then slept off for a few days, which is really not what he was meant to have done as part of his treatment. <sighs> but it's part of, he, was, he would say, you know, I was feeling very stressed out and I didn't know what else to do. Talking to somebody is, is not quick enough for him, not effective enough, but drinking can make him feel better more quickly. 
So, um, so violations of some of those treatment conditions, they can be threatening to treatment providers. When, 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 like as I was, I was asking him in detail about what he experienced and why and, and trying to understand things from his point of view. He found that process in itself quite threatening. In part, he was able to say because it made him feel ashamed to be reminded of the things that he had done and over which he felt he had so little control. And DNA meaning there that he didn't attend, he just didn't turn up for some of the outpatient appointments. Or when people would come to him rather than expect him to come to them, when services would go to his door, he would either not answer the door or not be in when they called. And the relevance is of, of, to his um, violence risk of treatment or supervision response is that he's basically a gentleman who's untreated. Um, for our purposes, we still haven't tackled some of the underlying problems that are maintaining his risk of harm, the problems that relate to his risk of harm to others. In respect to the clinical items at interview, this was a, quite a critical factor for us, um, that at interview he demonstrated little understanding, um, at least that I could access, um, of the role of alcohol in destabilising him and the role of alcohol as a, an ineffective and unuseful, unhelpful coping strategy. Um, he felt that his risks of harm towards other people were, were inflated by others, that there really wasn't a risk. He was actually a very meek and, uh, and ineffective gentleman. That was what he felt. So there was a, a disparity between what he thought and what other people thought. Um, and he thought that treatment was pointless. It was just something that he had to go through uh, just to get people off his back. So he didn't see the value of treatment. And this, was, this meant that, uh, that uh, collaborative uh, risk management wasn't going, to be problem, it wasn't going to be possible and that risk management was really going to have to be imposed on him from outside uh, until such time as he was able to see, I guess, some of the reasons why we were trying to, to, to work with him, all, all the services. In terms of violent ideation and intent currently, because remember in the clinical items you're looking at current um, problems in these areas, uh, we're looking at, uh, we were able to see uh, violent thoughts and urges evident. He's no longer associated with gangs, although he was concerned that if he would be walking along the street and saw a gentleman of perhaps his own age looking at him in a, in a way that he interpreted as, as being hostile, then perhaps he had been in a gang uh, against him in his youth and therefore he thought, gosh, that person might be going to harm me, therefore I need to protect myself and therefore I need to carry a weapon. So he was being persuaded not to carry weapons and he was being subject to um, uh, random searches when he would come and go from his supported accommodation to try to make sure that he wasn't carrying a weapon when he left. Uh, he, would, he got angry in the sessions with me, not, not, uh, not angry at me, but just angry talking about um, people that he felt had slighted him. And, and he was interested in films and, and uh, the like, films and, and comics and things that had violent themes of uh, slashing and burning and, and things. Relevance, well, he, of, these, of his current uh, violent ideation and intent, well, he's desensitised, he was, and he continues to be desensitised to violence. And there's a fear that some of the thoughts that he has, the urges and the fantasies that he has, and the films that he watched create scripts that under certain circumstances he may try to act out. And indeed, he'd get led, led us to believe that that's what he'd done on some occasions. He would be angry with somebody, and then he'd manufacture a, a conflict with that person, and then he would act out what he'd fantasised about harming, how he was going to harm that person. In terms of instability, when you're looking there for evidence, current evidence of affective, behavioural and cognitive uh, instability, and they were all present. His thinking processes were very um, muddled. They were in, um, sometimes not, not incoherent, but inconsistent. Uh, his behaviour was erratic. He would uh, um, uh, demonstrate really poor impulse control, really poor control over his behaviour when he was, um, when he was uh, distressed. And, um, he had less uh, good judgement when he was distressed than when he was quite calm. And all of this was made worse by alcohol. So he, um, in, in terms of its relevance to violence risk, it would make him reactive, unprepared, unfocused, therefore uh, have difficulty managing situations. Uh, then treatment or supervision response currently, well, he, uh, he had just in the last uh, uh, couple of uh, weeks, no, last week, um, uh, uh, prior to the second time that I had seen him, that he'd done the, the hoarding of his antabuse and uh, the, the, the binge drinking. And despite that being uh, against, uh, against the contract that had been agreed with him. 
he demonstrated passivity in his treatment. He didn't see that he had any great role to play in his treatment. And he had no motivation to help himself. He really saw you lot, us lot, as it's, it was our responsibility to give him treatment if we thought it was so important. Um, so he's not yet ready to manage or collaborate in managing his violence risk. And finally, the, the risk management um, items. His living situation, this was a, um, a, 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 a good one in the sense that he had supported accommodation, um, but, uh, and the supported accommodation had seemed to have had a positive effect on it in, it, him in that there were people on hand to help him 24 hours a day. But the problem was that he was only secured that accommodation for two years, and those two years are coming up shortly and he's becoming very anxious about it. And because he's defaulted several times from the program that was agreed with him when he went into the supported accommodation, he's got an appeal next week against being thrown out of the accommodation at the end of the contract. But it's not likely that he'll win that appeal because of these defaults. So that's the, that's the, that will destabilize him already. The thought of being out of that accommodation is destabilizing him. And there really is a significant and realistic risk that chaos will ensue within him if he doesn't have that supported accommodation, if he's left to fend for himself with only um, uh, members of a mental health team going in once or twice or three times a week. In terms of personal support, well, he's offended against almost every member of his family, and he has a non-existent relationship with his son, who um, is in his early 20s. Um, his family are prepared to be involved with him, but they, don't, they want to keep him at arm's length. And therefore, the only support that he has is from people that are paid to provide him with support. In respect of treatment and supervision response in the future, uh, he is likely to default because that's the, substantially the pattern that we've seen from him. We're not seeing a change or shift in his attitudes. Uh, but he does respond to uh, supervision because indeed he requires it. And the relevance of uh, future treatment of supervision response is that these problems will become exa exacerbated. The problems with his violence potential will persist and indeed become exacerbated if he doesn't have that further treatment, whether he likes it or not, and supervision. And in terms of stress or coping, this is a really critical factor. He's very, uh, 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 he has very problematic um, uh, stress reactions and coping strategies, very limited repertoire. And violence is much more likely when he's destabilized, when that violence seems to be motivated more by a desire to protect himself um, and to punish a person who he sees as being the cause of his distress. But I'll come to that shortly, because the next thing we look at then is formulation. So, going through the worksheet, I identified um, uh, a large number of factors that are relevant and try to think about the relevance of each of the individual factors. Okay, so that amounts to um, 16 factors that are definitely relevant. So that's a lot uh, of factors. So how do we knit that into a coherent explanation, a coherent theory of Paul's individual risk for violence? Well, let's think formulation and... Um, uh, Steve talked about this earlier on. We're talking about an organisational framework for producing a narrative that explains the underlying mechanism of the presenting problem, which in this case is Paul's violence, and proposes or leads to hypotheses regarding action to facilitate change, and that would be embodied in your risk management plan. So it's an explanation, it's an answer to the question, hopefully, it's an answer to the question, why is Paul, or any of this, the clients that we work with, why are they at risk for violence? What, does, what will violence do for them? I just want to remind you what the purpose of formulation is, um, uh, or what its uh, objectives are, is to organise and draw out the most important information relevant to the presenting problem, to try to create between yourselves or your team and your service users, your clients, and a mutually agreed understanding, or as mutually agreed as it's possible to achieve, mutual understanding of the problem, to make connections between those factors, those variables that you think have got relevance to the presenting problem, the violence, so all the risk factors, how do they come together, how do they interact with one another? Leading on to our views about what we need to do in terms of intervention to change the outcome that we fear may happen, and then as a basis for communicating that to others so that they will do what you are trying to do and what you want or what you would like to recommend be done in this client's case. 
So if that's the core purpose of formulation, um, Steve talked about this earlier on, forgive me for repeating it, but we're trying to understand why in the process, because what you've done, well, what I did with Paul is I've got those 16 very relevant risk factors on the table, so I've narrowed it down a little bit. Those are the most important ones, and I've got a sense of how they are relevant individually. But I, that's only a platform for me then to try to answer these two questions. Why has the client decided to be harmful before, or violent in this case, in Paul's case, before? And why might he choose to do so again? Because how we think about people's decision-making with respect to violence is that they've entertained the notion of harm and on some occasions in the past not dismissed it. So that's why I tried to spend uh, as much time as I could with Paul asking him about, and I didn't get too far, um, because it was... Uh, uh, that was in part what made him react a little badly to me personally, um, asking him about the times he'd been violent before. Because there have been times when he's thought about it and he's acted on it. It's not been dismissed. He was able to say that there were plenty of times when he wanted to be violent and he had been able to dismiss it. And usually by going off and finding the nearest pub and drinking instead of hitting people. But nonetheless, it was, a, it was, a, it was an understanding of some of the decision-making that he had engaged in. He's thinking about the positive consequences of violence on the occasions in which he's decided to go ahead and do it. He's decided that the negative consequences are acceptable and the options for enacting that violence where are, are feasible. So in, try, in talking to him about his past harmfulness, this is, some, this, is what I'm, this is my assumption about what's happened, his thinking processes, and I'm trying to understand just how they have worked with him in order that I can have a more clear idea of how it might work out or how it might show itself in the future. And then once I've taken the information I've got, those 16 most relevant risk factors, and try to use them to help me to answer that why, or those two why questions, why before and why in the future, I then think about, well, how might it look? And st again, uh, Steve talked excellently about this this morning, thinking about what it might look like with uh, Paul in this occasion. So a key task, as I said, is to organise um, uh, information. And, there are, and this is a, a, a marvellous addition to the, the worksheet, the extended worksheet. And uh, being obsessive compulsive, I will always use the extended worksheet because otherwise I may miss out important information. So, um, and you only get, really get the space to do this in the big worksheet. Is, um, is the chance and, and the chance to a whole empty page for you to, to sketch out your formulation. Now, I, um, I really like uh, a model for organising information that goes by the four P's description. I, I quite like that one. And I'll explain why I like that one. But Steve and, and Kevin and, and Henrik um, and Chris, they like the, well, I guess the 3D model, um, which I think is just a way of trying to draw out um, the, the, or try to, to organise the information. So let me explain what I, I think I'm doing. Thinking about the four P's, just when you're trying to think of the first one is... Um, predisposing factors. So what predisposes this person to violence? Well, what you've got, in effect, is a straight transfer uh, of the most relevant risk factors into these clusters. And, and as far as I was concerned, of those 16 risk factors, we could whittle them down to three kind of key areas of, of uh, predisposing risk, as it were. He has, was at risk of future violence because of his history of violence and his more general history of antisocial behaviour. So many of the other items that were seen to be relevant could be related to his personality presentation, that the reason why he had problems with insight, the reason why he had problems with treatment response and so forth, were because of his personality difficulties, all of which were exacerbated or made worse by his substance misuse. None of these are independent of one another, but this is a way of trying to see, right, well, these are three really strong motivators, really strong uh, variables in his future, um, relating to his future risk of um, anticipating his future risk of harm. In terms of triggers, that's the second P, precipitating factors, is what might switch risk on at any one point in time? What, might, what would have to be present within minutes or an hour or so of him being harmful? Well, we were able to, on, on the basis of this uh, initial understanding of the predisposing factors, we were able to say, well, when he's intoxicated, when he's actually drunk, or when he feels out of control, either of his circumstances or what's going on inside his head, when he doesn't feel he's got good enough control over his vengeful thoughts or his aggressive or angry thoughts, 
When he feels that everybody else is exercising control over his life apart from him, when he feels powerless. When he has in particular intrusive thoughts, when he's angry with somebody and he can't discharge that anger safely, so he then has thoughts, vengeful thoughts that will pop into his head that he, he feels he sort of, he sort of he, he, he dwells on and, and thinks about and rehearses, until he, often until he drinks to try to take them away or numb them. When he's in conflict, specifically in conflict with other people, and he had been in a relationship with a woman who also had a diagnosis of personality difficulties, so it was a very difficult relationship. Each, of, each one destabilised the other in a very cyclical way. He had lots of worries about other people, somewhat related to his history of uh, gang membership, but just generally he f thought that other people were going to do him a disservice in some way. And he was very humiliation and shame prone. So anything, including asking him about his history of violence and his symptoms and so forth, that could provoke in him or threaten him with a feeling of shame or humiliation, which would then be responded to with anger, re rejection, um, or with uh, the, the, the declared um, fantasy of, of doing you a, a mischief with a sharp knife. So we, take, we, have the, we start with the risk factors that, uh, under this model of organising the information, we start with the risk factors that are most relevant. We then extrapolate from that what we, think might be the, um, what we think might be the triggers, extrapolate from those risk factors and all the work you've done around um, understanding them and their relevance. And then thinking about the, the maintenance factors, being in this case, by my judgement, um, the persistence of his violence, his personality difficulties, which have so far... Uh, resistant to any sort of intervention, um, and his substance dependence, which had, has also been resistant to any lasting intervention, apart from his willingness under supervision to take and to abuse, which was positive, albeit that it was a relatively small uh, step. But this is, this is what I like about the 4P models, is it does make you think about protective factors. And I, and I, I do like that, because it's something to sell to the service users, to say, well, look, you haven't hit somebody for a while, you haven't been talking about violent thoughts for a while, what's working rather than what's not working? And what seemed to be protective for him, and this is what his uh, care coordinator is taking to the appeal panel next week as regards his supported accommodation, is that, that whether, we, whether they like it or not, his being in supported accommodation keeps a lid on his, uh, stabilises him a lot more than he would be if he was out in the community. So staving, stable living arrangements with people there to support him as and when he needs it does work for him. Uh, abstinence from alcohol does work. And where he could be encouraged to do it, uh, be compliant with any treatment uh, interventions um, and social support. So um, a community psychiatric nurse visiting him on a regular basis is a very good thing. But also having the support workers in the accommodation, just passing the time of day with him, going shopping with him, is extremely supportive for him and models some of the more adaptive coping that they're keen to encourage within him. So if we have a list of 16 relevant risk factors, this is a way of organising some of that information to start lifting it off the page, get, give you a sense of, of how the violence risk might manifest itself in the future. But there is this other model, which I, I also really like, which is thinking about it in terms of drivers, destabilizers, and disinhibitors. And if we think about drivers, we're thinking then about, well, of all the things we know about this service user, this client, what do we know might motivate or drive him being violent in the future? What are the motivational factors? Not just what's present at the time, but what does he actually seek to get out of it? And this gets to the core of the why question. And for, uh, for Paul, what we're looking at here is uh, what he was able to tell me and what I deduced from my understanding of the events that I'd looked at in the past was that he's more likely to be violent. He's, he wants to be violent. He wants to be violent towards somebody who he feels doesn't believe him. Um, when he feels discredited by another person, when he feels put down or disrespected. And his motivation then is about revenge or punishment. It's also he's motivated by trying to do things to people to take control over either his feelings or the circumstances that he's in. And he uses violence as an extreme way of trying to achieve that. But there's also an, um, the, the pressure of his peer group um, linked to some of those more broad antisocial attitudes and beliefs. He's still got a number of people that he likes to associate with who are uh, offenders themselves. 
In terms of disinhibitors, well, alcohol dependence and antisocial attitudes and beliefs act to disinhibit, make it more possible for violence to be uh, an outcome for him, make it uh, reasonable for him to think about uh, violent outcomes. And the destabilizers here are being a, a, a similar to before, uh, intoxication, conflict, especially if that conflict involves him ha um, uh, having feelings of being disrespected, challenged, humiliated, and so forth. So these are ways of taking a list of 16 items and trying to create, to, to mould them into, uh, uh, into a framework of understanding um, on the basis of which you can then write your formulation itself. But just a, a quick comparison of, of trying to organise the information by these two models. I think I really like the protective factors um, that you're required to look for in the 4P model, but I really... Oops, Daisy. Uh, oh, dear. <laughs> I haven't got my timing right there. Um, but I really like the focus on motivational factors in a 4D model. But whatever they are, the ways of trying to get you to think about some of the, the, the mechanisms of this person's harm potential. Both should lead you to an arrangement of the evidence that will allow you to explain why violence is a risk for this client. But your next step then is to think, well, what might it look like? And for Paul, just very quickly, for Paul, um, I came up with three scenarios. Um, the first scenario is that he assaults another person with whom he is in conflict. That might be somebody in a supported accommodation or a person in this, um, uh, uh, who's providing care to him. As an act, and his violence then would be as an act of revenge for comments made or deeds done or perceived by him to have been made or done. The victim would be likely to be a peer, uh, male or female. And there's a lower threshold to this outcome if he's intoxicated or otherwise destabilised. The second scenario is that he'd assault a stranger because of that person's critical manner towards him or Paul's perception that the other person was being critical towards him, like the person who he thought might have been in a gang with him 20 years ago and therefore was, was harbouring some sort of um, uh, grudge against him uh, as he would walk past them in the street and therefore feel that he'd have to preemptively strike against that person. What are you looking at kind of thing? That victim could also be male or female, and a low threshold to this outcome, again, if intoxicated or otherwise destabilised, or when he has a heightened fear of harm, such as, and, and, and this is the worry about his accommodation being at risk because he feels this general sense of threat, therefore his perception of threat in his environment is lowered. And the third uh, scenario is that he would assault a healthcare professional um, because treatment threatens his precarious sense of control or because he, he perceives treatment as critical and therefore threatening. And the victim there could also be a male or a female. So that way we're able then to go back and see whether there are any triggers that we've missed out and, and so forth. And that led to a formulation, which I'm just going to, it's only a paragraph, I'm just going to read it out to you. And this is the basis, this is like the important, I would like to think, the important bit of the report that's gone back to the referrer. And the formulation, and, and, and all that information, laying out the information that, then that we allows us to then explain. And hopefully what I'll read out to you in the moment is what uh, will, will be an explanation, as you might recognise it, for his harm potential. Paul is at risk of being violent again in the future in situations in which he feels A, criticised or disrespected or disbelieved, or B, powerless and out of control of the events uh, going on around him and his thoughts and feelings. Such circumstances challenge Paul's limited repertoire, range of coping strategies, increase his level of arousal, fear and anger, and make, him, um, make worse a sense of himself that is fragile and incomplete. When intoxicated or in the context of multiple compounded stressors, such as conflict, especially in his intimate relationships, uh, or when worried about his accommodation, uh, when integrated with an antisocial peer group and in the absence of consistent risk management, he's likely to perceive criticism more frequently from more sources and in a wider range of circumstances. In addition, Paul is likely to react more extremely, especially if he has to hand the means with which to harm someone seriously, such as a knife. Paul has a history of violence in the course of a lifetime of a range of antisocial behaviours, which commenced in his mid-teens, and he's now in his early 40s, and is essentially an escalating trajectory. Early difficulties in his upbringing, caregiving problems, for instance, and inconsistencies, real relationship problems and traumatic experiences, have generated over time personality attributes in Paul that have left him poorly equipped to cope with the challenge of adult life without support. 
um, and uh, poorly uh, equipped because of things like poor identity disturbance, unstable mood and cognition and behaviour, poor impulse control, and reliant on substances, mainly alcohol now, to help him as he sees it to try to cope. His little awareness of his problems and of how to avoid them or manage them when they occur. However, it's notable that when Paul has been in receipt of a good supervision regime, this has offered him valuable support and stability, and therein will lie the key to the management of his risk of future violence. So that would be your formulation gotten to by the, the systematic review of information and its organisation using one of these organisational frameworks. And just, just to let you know, and, and I've, got, I've got about a minute to go, <laughs> approximately, <laughs> um, just to say that the, um, Steve um, was the first author in a, in a paper uh, in 2011, which we tried to set out a, a, f a framework for evaluating formula formulations, because we do need to improve the way in which we, uh, people would write these sorts of summaries um, and try to, to um, uh, understand the key qualities of formulation so we know a good one when we see it and so that we can um, uh, understand whether the formulation has actually made a difference. Different sorts of formulations have made a difference to the outcome. And in some work that we're doing down in, 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 in England, uh, working the NHS providers working in partnership with probation, we're teaching lots of people to do formulations and we're going to be using this uh, f uh, checklist um, it's an uh, evaluation checklist to try to determine its quality. And if you want to know more about it, then um, Steve is the first author in an excellent chapter in this book, um, uh, which I commend to you because it's a really uh, sterling piece of work. So, just to say, where does all this go? Well, treatment, supervision, monitoring, and victim safety planning. This has led us, this formulation is a direct link between the formulation and what we want to do about it. Alcohol management via uh, abstinence or ant abuse, anxiety and stress management, trying to increase the sense of mindfulness and other sorts of medication that will help stabilise his mood. Psychological therapies, I'm going to suggest that uh, his, uh, the referrer keeps them on the back burner for some time yet. They're far too threatening. And I would say this would be a direct risk of him defaulting and therefore destabilising him if he's offered treatment that's specifically about his problems. I say deal with the effects of his condition rather than the condition itself at this stage. In terms of supervision, well, his accommodation is key. Uh, financial security is also very important. Activity management, keeping him busy and distracted, modelling good coping strategies. Medication compliance and structure and containment are all really important to positively supporting him. In terms of monitoring, uh, monitoring his compliance and his avoidance of any treatment uh, uh, or social engagements that are good for him, monitoring his alcohol use, any preoccupations he may have with alcohol and indeed violence, social network and peer influences, weapon ca weapons carrying, success of anxiety, stress management and e EWS early warning signs uh, which will require some further action, whether he's restless, sweating, tearful and so forth. These indicators of high levels of anxiety suggest something's more imminently about to happen. And in terms of victim safety plans, the practitioners to work ideally in pairs with Paul, certainly take a team approach with him and manage conflict in group living situation through temporary separation followed by mediation. So what we were able to say is directly from the assessment led directly to the formulation, the formulation directly led to the risk management plan. And you should be able to take each of those risk management recommendations and trace it backwards to the formulation and then to the assessment findings. And that creates an integrated whole. And then the final options, and this is my um, uh, last slide. Um, he, uh, he was regarded as a moderate priority in terms of case we wanted to do something uh, with him to do with his uh, accommodation uh, 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 pretty much uh, immediately. Uh, risk of uh, serious physical harm we regarded as uh, moderate. Um, imminent violence, he, wasn't, he was not thought to be imminently at risk of violence. Case review, however, we recommended them to be regular, very regular, and he was also thought to be at risk of harming himself with many of the same risk factors and uh, triggers. Um, 